Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the 25th year of Reformed Church Center programs. We are begin it, this is we are reaching 25. It's actually very interesting because no one from the Reformed Church Center seems to know what when exactly the starting date of the Reformed Church Center is. There have been extensive discussions. It's wonderful to be in a room full of church historians who are dealing with a relatively recent event and can't figure out what the date is. But that's okay. We So we tell ourselves that um, the Reformed Church Center officially started when John Coakley mailed the first invitations to the first conference back in the days when, when we did these things with postage stamps and envelopes and all sorts of fun stuff like that that we hardly ever see anymore. But I am glad you are all here. Welcome to today's program, a proposed new look for RCA polity as we deal with the biggest of the amendments coming out of General Synod 2024 to the classes and help everybody get a handle on what this is and what it's supposed to do. Our panelists, first from the Commission on Church Order, we have Brian Andrew, who's an attorney in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and a member of Central Reformed Church Grand Rapids. He's been on the Commission on Church Order since 2021. Amanda Brule is Vice President of Operations at New Brunswick Theological Seminary, and so I am seeing her now because she is in her office just down the hall from me, bouncing a signal through all sorts of cables off a satellite to another satellite, back down to Earth through all sorts of cables and back to my office. This is what's so wonderful about technology. Um, so Amanda, Amanda's here. She has been on the commission since 2023. And Howard Motes is an RCA minister, um, has served congregations in Bradenton, Florida, and Jenison, Michigan, and has served as clerk of South Grand Rapids Classes and as the clerk of Regional Synod of the Great Lakes, um, and is serving his fourth term on the Commission on Church Order. So there are only there are only a few of us in the whole RCA who've served four terms on any commissions, Howard. So we're we're in that special rarefied breed. And then we have three stated clerks from classes who are going to start off the questioning. They're going to ask the kind of questions that stated clerks would would ask because they know what they're going to get asked in their in their classes meetings when they deal with these amendments. Rita Burkhard is in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. She is stated clerk for the classes of Canadian Prairies. Grace Rim is stated clerk for the classes of Rockland Westchester and second vice president of the Regional Synod of New York and co-pastor of Lamb of God Reformed Ministries. And Carlos Coro is a minister of word and sacrament who is the stated clerk of classes Central California. Um, and so we are glad to have all of you here. Um, Carlos, so Carlos, this is a this for him, this is definitely a morning, a morning gig. He is he is doubly allowed to sip his coffee because he's still injecting his daily dose of caffeine. Um, so is Rita. They're they're working much earlier than the rest of us. But that's who everybody is. So we're going to start off with a presentation from the church order folks, and then the um, three stated clerks are each going to get to ask a couple questions and get some answers, and then we're going to open it up to everybody. Okay, so let's get started with the church order, folks. Very good. Thank you, James. Um, good morning and good afternoon uh, to everyone here. I'm Brian Andrew, and as James said, I'm privileged to be joined by two of my colleagues, Howard Mose and Amanda Brule, and we're going to hope to do three things for you here. Um, first, I'm going to kind of give you a background on on what we did and, and how we got to this point. I think the first question raised in the seminar materials is why is there this one huge ungainly amendment? I'm going to try and answer that for you. Um, and then after that, Howard is going to spend some time talking with you about the numerous resources that are available to you and your groups as you go through this restructuring process and your discernment process. And then finally, Amanda is going to talk to you about kind of what comes next and what's left to do. And um, spoiler alert, it's probably a lot. I mean, in, in many ways, we have probably just done the easy part of this whole thing. 
Um, so she's going to talk with you about that. And then obviously we'll have some time at the end for some questions. So let me start with a kind of a quick recap of the over of the restructuring process. The, um, the restructuring process began, I think it was Senate 2021 that directed the formation of the restructuring team. Uh, they were formed in early 2022 and then spent the last two years kind of doing their work. Um, the Commission on Church Order, um, we supported them in kind of an advisory role. We came alongside them. I think we had uh, at least one person at just about every restructuring team meeting over the course of the past couple of years, and there were many of them. That group did a lot of hard work. Um, all of the ideas for restructuring came from the restructuring team. It was kind of their job to come up with the substance of their recommendations, and our role was to talk with them about implementation. How could we do this? The feasibility of implementing these ideas. So in terms of you know who came up with the ideas, it was the restructuring team, and we kind of tried to assist them in figuring out how can we get this done. Ultimately, the restructuring team presented, I think, 11 recommendations to General Senate 2024, and we are here just to talk about one of them, which was the recommendation that we um, condense our polity so that there's a single middle assembly in between consistory and the General Synod, and in that process, also create some new judicial bodies. Now, I counted, I think that recommendation was 19 words, uh, but it spawned almost 34 pages worth of changes to our Book of Church Order, which is the one huge ungainly amendment. Um, and that happens, you know, when you when you pull a, a part out of your polity, when you pull a level out of your polity, you need to make sure the functions of that polity go someplace else. Um, which is what kind of we had to do. In terms of the substance of what the amendment does, we actually put together a video uh, for the delegates at Synod that kind of explains um, what the amendment is and what it does. And there's really kind of no better way for us to give you that information than to just show you that video. I think I think this thing has a couple of hundred views right now. So on a, as our esteemed moderator said, Chris uh, Jacobson, that's basically a viral video for church governance. Um, so, uh, so we're going to go ahead and show that video to you now, um, and then I'll just have a couple of remarks after that. Hello, delegates. General Synod 2024 is finally here, and this is the year that you will have to make some big decisions. After years of hard work, the restructuring team will be presenting you with some plans on how to restructure the RCA. Some of those plans involve substantial changes to our Book of Church Order. In fact, 34 pages worth of changes if you have looked in your workbook and counted. We understand that that is a lot of information to process. If you thought, hey, it would be great if someone would put together a short video helping to explain what these 34 pages of changes are and what they do, and if you could use some rudimentary animations, that would be super helpful. Well, then this video is for you. In the next seven minutes or so, we'll go over what all of these 34 pages of changes do, why they are in your workbook, and how they will help us to continue doing things decently and in order. But to get from here to there, we first need to start with the basics. In the RCA, we have four assemblies or bodies that do the work of the church, the consistory, the classes, the regional synod, and the general synod. Each of these assemblies serves both a legislative or governing function and also a judicial function. When an assembly is acting as part of the judicial system or in a judicial capacity, we call that assembly a judicatory. Let's take a closer look at how our judicial system works, as that is the part of our polity that is affected the most by the restructuring proposals. Disputes generally enter our judicial system either at the consistory or the classist level. Once a judicatory gets a dispute, our Book of Church Order contains judicial procedures designed to ensure a fair and impartial process. One of the key features of our judicial system is the guaranteed right of not one but two appeals. So looking at the overview of our system, a judicial decision by the Board of Elders of a consistory can be appealed first to the classes and then, if so desired, to the regional synod. Similarly, for a matter that starts in the classes, 
A judicial decision by a classes can be appealed first to the regional synod and then to the general synod. We like this to appeal feature and we want to keep it. Now, as you probably know, the restructuring team has recommended two significant changes to this organization. First, the restructuring team has recommended consolidating the classes and regional senate into a single middle assembly, which for this video, we will continue to call the classes. Second, the restructuring team has recommended having the general synod meet in person once every three years rather than every year. These changes leave us with some challenges because with the regional synod gone and the general synod not guaranteed to be available in any given year, we lose the ability to have the two appeals that are an important part of our judicial system. So what's the solution? The solution is the expanded use of the Judicial Business Commission. As its name implies, a Judicial Business Commission is basically a subcommittee of the entire judicatory. These commissions are familiar to us because we already use them. The General Senate has a Judicial Business Commission and many classes use Judicial Business Commissions as well. Under our current BCO, these Judicial Business Commissions are generally limited to investigating charges or complaints, making sure appeals are in order, and then making reports and recommendations to the entire judicatory. As currently constituted, these Judicial Business Commissions generally cannot make final decisions. Our recommendation would change that slightly. Because these commissions already exist and are familiar to us, we recommend expanding the role of these judicial business commissions to fill the void in our judicial system created by having a single middle assembly and moving to a triennial general synod. Here's how it would work. Each classes would be required to form a judicial business commission. This commission would be composed of anywhere between three and nine members. It should be no more than about one quarter of the size of the full classes. The Classes Judicial Business Commission would then serve as its own judicatory. The commission would, consistent with our judicial procedures, hold hearings, review documents, and receive evidence. In many cases, the commission would perform all of the functions it does today with the added responsibility of simply making a final decision on the matter. That decision could then be appealed to the full classes. In that case, the members of the Judicial Business Commission, having already heard and decided the matter, would not participate in the decision of classes on the appeal, thus ensuring procedural fairness. The General Synod Commission on Judicial Business will work a little differently as disputes can no longer be appealed to the entire General Synod. Instead, the General Synod Commission on Judicial Business will be substantially larger than it is today, consisting of a representative from each of the separate classes. When a matter comes to the General Synod Commission on Judicial Business, the moderator will randomly select a panel consisting of nine members of the full commission to hear and decide the matter first. If permitted, a decision of the panel may be appealed to the full commission. Again, as the panel members already heard and decided the matter, those panel members will not participate in the full commission's consideration of the appeal, thus ensuring procedural fairness. Now let's go back to our overview and put in the Judicial Business Commissions. Here you see that we have the consistory of the classes and the general synod as before, but now we also have the Classes Judicial Business Commission and the panel of the General Senate Judicial Business Commission. Matters that start at the consistory level can be appealed first to the Classes JBC and, if desired, then to the full classes. Likewise, matters that begin at the classes level will first be referred to the Classes JBC. The decision of the Classes JBC can then be appealed to the full classes and, if desired, to a panel of the General Senate Judicial Business Commission. The full General Senate Judicial Business Commission will always serve as the final level of appeal when permitted. One special note on General Senate professors. A panel of the General Senate Judicial Business Commission will be the first to hear and decide any disciplinary matters of a General Senate professor related to doctrine. The decision of the panel may then be appealed to the full commission. And as noted, the decision of the full commission is always the final decision available. Congratulations, that is everything related to the judicial changes that are in the workbook. And if you have made it this far, you only need go a little farther as there is just one more thing. Under our current system, certain of our councils and commissions have representatives from the regional synods as members. For example, a portion of the general synod council is comprised of members from each of the regional synods. If the regional synods go away, we need a new way for replacing those members. 
When you read through the proposed changes, you will see that we are recommending using a system of equitable rotation among the classes to fill these positions. We have not said now what that equitable rotation should be as what is equitable will depend on such things as the number of classes that we have in the future. But the idea is to guarantee a fair rotation of representation in these positions from among the classes. Ultimately, it will be up to a future general synod to determine exactly what that equitable rotation is. The 34 pages worth of changes that you see in your workbook implement the ideas we discussed here. We hope you have found this video helpful in understanding not only what those changes are, but what those changes intend to accomplish. All right, um, so that's uh, that's our video, an oldie but a goodie. Um, there were two two things in that we didn't bring up um, in the video that are relevant to our discussion here today and probably relevant to you. Um, when I talked about, you know, we had to make sure that the functions of the regional synod went other places. There were there were two kind of key functions um, that uh, I'm sure are of interest to you. The first is we gave the um, we gave the general synod the authority to form, disband, or combine middle assemblies, and then we gave the ability to uh, middle assemblies to transfer churches between middle assemblies by consent. Um, both of those functions resided at the regional synod um, under our current BCO, and they get um, moved to either the general synod or the middle assemblies um, in the proposed amendment. Um, so that is, that's kind of everything that I have um, from the, how did we get here and what does this big amendment do? And then Howard's gonna talk to you next about the resources that are available to you as you go forward with this. Uh, yes, my, I'm Howard Maltz, and I'm going to talk to you about the resources that are available uh, both to the classes as they consider their votes on the proposed amendments and also the regional synods as they uh, enter this time of conversation about what the future will look like if the regional synod goes away. Uh, first, uh, you should know that all the resources that were available to the delegates uh, of General Synod are still available if you know where to look. Uh, and that's on rca.org forward slash workbook. Uh, that includes the report of the restructuring team as it was presented to the General Synod starting on page 104 and the report of the Commission on Church Order starting on page 236. Um, these reports also can be found in the minutes of General Synod that were just published. So now you have two places where you can see them, and they're available on rca.org slash minutes. So you can see the, the minutes have been published. They released now. Uh, and in the minutes, you'll find the report of the Commission on Church Order on CO244, starting on page 246, and the report of the restructuring team starting on page 111. Uh, so those are the official first presentation of the reports, uh, and then their final version that's found in the minutes of General Synod. I mentioned the General Synod workbook first because it contained a number of links that were not found anywhere else until very recently. Uh, and following the links there, uh, you can see things that you just saw. In fact, somebody already asked the question of, where can you find that video? Well, actually, now you can find it on two places on the RCA website. One is in that workbook page, uh, and one is on a new page that has just been put together called the Guide for Understanding Middle Assemblies. And I think Amanda is going to give us that link. Uh, that includes most of the documents. I think it only omits one that you can find on the workbook page. And so let me talk about the workbook page first. If you're looking there, you look under the restructuring team report, there's an appendix called restructuring team FAQ or frequently asked questions um, that you will not find in the published minutes of General Synod uh, or in the original workbook text, but as an appendix. So if you're looking for that, you can always find it on that workbook page, but you can now it's also been moved to the page I just mentioned, the Guide for Understanding Middle Assemblies. There's a second appendix that's particularly helpful to the regional synods uh, that's under the restructuring team called Potential Principle and Process Ideas for Forming Middle Assemblies. 
And that second document would be really helpful for anyone who's asking questions. Well, what does it mean for the regional synod? What are our options? What's the difference between the regional synod as a part of our governance structure and the regional synod as a corporation? Um, under the Commission on Church Order, you'll find a link to the eight minute video uh, on that workbook page that you just saw. Uh, and also another appendix called the Disciplinary and Judicial Procedures as they would read if proposed amendments are adopted. Uh, that's for anybody who wants to have a clean copy and, and goes crazy when they try to read the proposed amendments uh, that include underlining and, and deleting. Um, so underlining is always new text. Deleting is obviously text that will no longer appear. If you look, want to look at a clean copy, I think that's now the only place you can see it is on the workbook page under the Commission on Church Order. Um, also, though, for stated clerks and for anybody who wants to see the published document that will go to the classes, uh, just released is the 2024 Proposed Amendments to the Constitution of the Reformed Church of America. They are available on the clerk's private page along with the vote form, form for voting. So if you have a class this meeting this fall, and you need that document, it's now available on the clerk's website, but it is also available on that other page I mentioned that's just been created on the RCA website called the Guide for Understanding Middle Assemblies. That web page also has right on the top a link to the video that you found uh, that we presented um, uh, just a little while ago. Um, if you are looking at the proposed amendments, the list of all the amendments that will be voted on uh, by each classes this year, you will find that what we're talking about today is listed as number nine, and that is um, the um, global, that's, that's the uh, form for um, the combination of the uh, level of governance between the consistory and the general synod and the new form of judicial bodies. I think that's what it's called. A little cumbersome, but that's what it's called. Uh, and it's listed as number nine in that list of proposed amendments. Number 10 is actually the global amendment that will replace the name classes with middle assembly. Uh, and you can see all of the affected sections listed there under number nine, but not every single amendment that will take place. Um, one more thing, if you are looking for additional resources, don't forget um, that you can also go on the RCA website and look at the daily summaries of what happened at General Synod. And don't forget uh, your General Synod delegates. Uh, many times classes do these. Uh, and, you know, we kind of like, well, we forget about who we sent to General Synod and we kind of like wonder who we could talk to if we really want to know. Oh, what happened? Don't forget the generals and the delegates that you sent this past summer. Include them in your conversations. Maybe ask them to make presentations uh, to your classes with a little bit of homework. They probably can do an adequate job of presenting uh, what happened at General Senate. Uh, and that's all I have to say. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes just about what's next. I'm not going to try to be a fortune teller here, but just kind of go through some of the scenarios and, and what we're thinking um, and what you should be thinking as the timeline progresses towards General Synod of, of next year. So each classes will vote this year on the BCO amendments that are being proposed, and those meetings will happen over the next six months or so. Um, we'll find out the results of the classes vote when the General Synod workbook comes out in May. Um, and as you know, it must receive two thirds of the classes to pass. Uh, if it passes the classes, a vote will then come to the General Synod for ratification. So we're going to kind of do our scenario bit here. So if the ratification, so if it passes classes and the ratification happens, um, many of the regional synods have already begun planning next steps on how they will facilitate a restructuring of their classes. Uh, there will not be a one size fits all solution. Some regional synods have uh, begun this work of what they will may, may look like if this amendment passes and ha some have even started to have those conversations. Some regional synods will have more legal ramifications than others. And again, this won't be a one size fits all and it will likely take multiple years to fully implement. We anticipate that we will be drafting some additional guidance, perhaps in the forms of rules and regulations, establishing a transition timeline and other guidances that churches, classes, and regional synods can use to implement these changes. 
If you have questions on what this restructure could look like in your regional synod, I would suggest, as Howard said, looking at that potential principle and process ideas for forming middle assemblies. This uh, has a lot of helpful questions and reasoning and working through a process. May also give insight into why we're even considering this restructuring. This is, and I just want to say personally, like, I think this is really a time for us to reflect and dream of what God is calling us to in the future. Whether this, um, whether these amendments pass or not, I really want to encourage you to take the time to consider and pray where God is calling our congregations, our classes, our regional synods, and our, our denomination in the future, and how this amendment fits into. It. So the other scenario is if this doesn't pass, I want to say some regional synods and classes will still restructure it. Some have even started in this process. Some have taken this opportunity to relook at the way they function and are doing this on their own, not with these amendments um, being passed. And some will have to restructure out of necessity with significant percentages of congregations leaving out of some classes and regional synods. They'll have to find a way forward within the current structure, but and this may involve things like merging classes and regional synods. So we're concluding our allotted time a little bit early because we want to make sure that we have time to answer specific questions from the clerks that are here with us and from all of you that are attending. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to the clerks now. Hi, everyone. My name is Grace Rim from Rockland Westchester of Classes. Uh, it's nice meeting you all. I'm hoping that you can all hear me. Um, we have a, well, a question that has been, um, been asked even within the Senate and within our classes, what will these middle assemblies look like in terms of a geographic? Um, and of, is it going to look more of like an affinity classes? Um, or is that the decision that the middle assembly will make? Anyone? <laughs> yeah, ultimately, ultimately, that's a decision that the middle assembly is going to make. Um, okay. in, in the in this process, they the middle assemblies will figure out kind of what they look like, how big they are, and and kind of where they are. So the number of assemblies they can make that decision once that comes. N nothing okay. in the amendments require any set number of okay. middle assemblies. Okay, so it's more autonomous. Um, they can make decisions on their own and want to do what God wants them to do in their mm -hmm. assembly. Okay. In, yeah, in conversation with the regional synod, because the regional synod at this point uh, is charged with uh, beginning this conversation and the word that the Book of Church Order use is consult. Consulting is, which suggests the conversation that needs to go on not just a sharing of minutes, but a conversation that needs to begin now, if it hasn't already, about the future. Okay. Thank you. And a question that has been um, been asked also, concerned about the undercare process of ordination. Um, what would that look like in the future under, under the middle assemblies? How do we take our candidates under care? Does it look the same or will there be a universal or standard process or guideline that will be given throughout our denomination and our assemblies? This is one thing that probably won't change at all uh, because the middle assemblies will take over the entire function of the classes, uh, which includes the majority of the responsibility for um, helping candidates uh, before ministry move through the process. I imagine the General Synod will continue to have its role as it has in the past of providing um, standards and uh, there are standards in the Book of Church Order that have not gone away uh, for uh, candidates for ministry. So that those sections of the Book of Church Order were not touched uh, by these changes and all of the responsibilities of the classes will go to the middle assembly. And I do want to say, in addition to that, there there was some conversation from, or there was some recommendations brought up to consider the equity that is happening um, 
for candidates. And so that's something separate from this, but that is, uh, I think there was a task force or there was going to be a task force that's gonna be formed to look at those types of things. So there may be things coming down the line, but structure wise, there's nothing changing in this. And a quick last question about terms of equity. Um, a lot of concerns um, among our classes, including the regional synod, what would that look like um, all around with our multicultural um, and ethnic backgrounds? I just came from another um, seminar, uh, webinar uh, that uh, was with uh, the Bob staff uh, this morning. And we talked about equity in terms of, of uh, compensation and benefits. Uh, that conversation is going on. Uh, and so if you're thinking about dollars and cents and how we can care for ministers, um, that conversation has already started within the Board of Benefits Services. Uh, and they are seriously looking at um, the standards uh, that um, are being set in the annual booklet that was just released. If you're not familiar with that, the Board of Benefit Services uh, releases every year an annual booklet that's available on the RCA website that talks about all of the benefits and compensation um, that ministers receive. Thank you so much. That's the end of my questions. Thank you. Hi, it's uh, Rita Burkhardt. Um, I have a question, and I think it may, um, I don't know who will answer it. It's, it's one of the jobs that the clerks do is to get licenses for ministers to perform marriages. And I don't know if that goes across state lines, but it certainly is doesn't go across our provincial lines. So I can only do this for someone in my classes, which is now two provinces, but is going to get complicated. Is there, is this something you guys can answer or is this just totally a different question altogether? I could take a stab at it because uh, I sure. spent a little bit of time in ministry in Canada. So I know that they have some unique roles. Um, in the United States, it's rare that any pastor is questioned on how he is, if, if he's properly credentialed. And that's, of course, you're talking about New York City. Uh, but uh, the state of clerk simply, if a pastor is asked to prove these are ordained, uh, of course, the pastor could produce their ordination certificate um, that should have been issued at the time of their ordination. But if that's been lost uh, someplace in their files, um, the state of clerk should be able to produce a, a paper that says, I hereby certify that this is an ordained minister in the Reformed Church in America in good and regular standing. Um, and if a classist has been doing that and needs to do that in a Canadian province, the middle assembly would take over that responsibility. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, to listen, to be able to share, and also to just be able to discern together God's best for our preferred future. And um I think one quick question, which is more of a housekeeping question before I get into some of the other uh, clerk related questions based on conversations I've had with my region is, do we need to vote at our fall meeting or can we wait until spring? Um, because I think initially we were going to have the discussion and then potentially go ahead and vote um, in the spring, but we're wondering um, since the materials for voting on amendments were mentioned today um, and they're on the clerk's page, uh, what would be your suggestion or even direction on that? Should we vote in our classes in the fall or can that wait? I'll take a stab at it again. Um, we would, um, there are some advantages to doing it earlier rather than later. Uh, one would be, hopefully, your General Synod delegates still have a better memory of their experience, which might fade over time. Um, but on the other hand, it, the classes uh, delegates um, might want to have additional time to study the proposed amendments, and it would be better to uh, vote on them in the spring. Actually, it doesn't make much difference because of the way the General Synod handles the reporting of the uh, votes of classes. They aren't released at the time the General Senate office receives them. They are kept in secret. 
until the General Synod workbook is published uh, in the early May. Um, so reporting it earlier rather than later has no practical advantage uh, to the whole denomination, but there may be some advantages or disadvantages for your additional, for your particular classes, depending on whether you feel you're ready to make the vote this fall or need additional time. Okay, but it's not required. We do have until the spring to be able to vote, right? Okay. Yes. Very good. Well, um, I think that one of the, the comments that I wanna make before um, some of the questions on behalf of our region and classes really has to do with a, a desire for us um, seeking not any type of micromanagement because that's certainly not within the spirit of the RCA, but instead of seeking a bit of guided leadership from denominational leaders, uh, a type of guided leadership that leads to, um, you know, what's been called uh, in the past by by some, um, you know, leadership consultants, stewardship delegating, which is an authentic empowerment to a local a local group, um, uh, versus just go for delegating, which can often be just dumping, you know, something huge and abstract into the hands of of a local um, uh, entity or group without real um, um, without really being supplied with the the you know everything that's needed in order to to make wise and and uh, thriving decisions. So really looking for ways to rhyme in in the principles and, and just. Clarity on the principles and parameters, but then freedom in the particularities. And I understand that in the potential principle and process for middle assemblies um, document, some of that is is uh, going to be there. So we'll definitely reference that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that that's just just a general comment. But some of the questions that we have from the far west region are um, really just. Uh, some guidelines again and and some some guidance or mentorship on how to implement this so for example the guidelines from the restructure team suggest the middle assembly of a minimum of 10 churches with a thousand combined members um, what thoughts does the panel have about the viability of smaller middle assemblies that perhaps aren't and don't fit that criteria, or perhaps it looks different in some other kind of way. So that's my first question. I think that's a harder question for at least CCO to answer because uh, I think that's more of a restructuring question because um, we weren't in on all of those conversations with how they came up with these numbers. Um, we were just more tasked with how we figure out how we get our uh, the BCO to, to allow for this. Um, so I don't, yeah, I don't know if Howard has any other thoughts beyond that, but I would say it's more of a, re, that would be more of a restructuring and what was behind the restructuring, which I do believe some of that information may have been in the restructuring report as well for their rationale behind some of, uh, for their rationale even behind the restructuring and those types of things. Um, so for, for those exact size numbers and why, and the rationale behind them, I do believe that is in the restructuring report. And it, it does have to do with being able so, to support some of the staffing needs that they saw that a classes um, could have. That's actually the most common question that I get is what's the right size for a classes? And that conversation started years ago. Uh, you know, so it continues, you know, what is the right size for a classes? Um, that varies so much depending upon uh, the churches that are involved, the resources that the local churches have, uh, their historic relationships with uh, their regional synod, how the regional synod has been structured. Uh, I think there are really three options uh, when it comes to determining that size. Uh, and, and that is that the classes stay their current size and function as they have been. But then they have to figure out if it's a very small classes how they will get resources. Now, the denomination will continue to provide some, even after the regional synod goes away. Uh, in fact, now they have a you know a central email called equip at rca.org 
uh, where they will respond to any question that you have uh, regarding denominational services and functions. Um, so the denomination is is attempting to provide uh, direction and, and uh, assistance wherever it's needed. Um, however, some of the, the another option is that the regional synods will continue to function in some way, perhaps by uh, keeping their corporations going and provided um, services on the basis of contracted need. Um, so regional synod, within our regional synod, I'll give you one example. Uh, we have right now a fairly good um, transitional ministry uh, operation through our regional synod staff and Luminix. We also have some visioning programs that are available to local churches. Uh, within our region, the classes value uh, these particular things and often make take advantage of the uh, specialized transition ministers that have been trained uh, during a time where a church does not have an installed uh, pastor. So there's a conversation going on right now within our regional synod. If when the regional synod, uh, assuming the regional synod goes away, uh, how can we continue these services to the classes that are in our area? And there are all kinds of possibilities there. Uh, including having the classes provide some kind of voluntary contribution to a, a regional synod uh, or a organization that functions in the place of the regional synod providing programmatic support. Thank you. Um, were there any other uh, comments on that question before I move on to the next question? Okay, so um, another question that came up, and again, uh, I realize some of these questions may be best fit for the restructuring team um, members, but um, perhaps there can be some valuable insight with us uh, collectively engaging these com these questions as well. But um, what are new ways, if any, that we can build relationships as we restructure. How, how do we encourage organic connections? Um, and that may be tied to just another uh, conversation on um, uh, another question on affinity middle assemblies. Um, is, is that something that, that would be um, encouraged or what are, what are thoughts, pros and cons on that? But, can we look to uh, the the experiences of um, of affinity classes? How how has that been going? Has that does that work well? And would that be a potential prototype for um, this new body um, of of potential middle affinity assemblies? I would say based on my experience and what I have heard is there is going to be pros and cons to affinity classes, just like anything else. And some people are very interested in them and some people are very not interested in them um, is what I, it's what my experience has been talking with people. For some people, they really want diversity. They want diversity of theology. They want diversity of ethnicity. They want all of that diversity. And that's, you know, and then there are other people who, who feel differently and, and would like to be in a group that they feel like can connect on a, on a certain level on something, um, that, that type of thing. What I would say when you talk about organic connections, I think one of the things that this opens us up to is there are regional synods that are running some programs that aren't available to churches that aren't within those regional synods. And I think there is some opportunity here for us to talk about what different regional synods are currently providing and how that could be provided to maybe more or different churches than in the past. Um, and I think, you know, like Howard was talking about, you know, there are certain churches within there within that regional synod that have found programs that have been very helpful. I know that's true in other in other regional synods. So again, I think this is an opportunity for us also to learn from that and to say, what do we want to adopt, adapt or what can be expanded to include more um, and those types of things. So that's one place that I see opportunity within this, whether that's through an affinity or just through being able to do different kind of resource resourcing. Um, I think there is some opportunity for us to serve um, each other in different ways and maybe what we've imagined in the past. 
Let me also maybe talk, because I, I think I've seen a couple of questions about how, how would the regional synod go about, you know, kind of phasing out of the RCA polity. And um, and the, actually, I mean, these, these regional synods are almost certainly creatures of state law. They, they're ecclesiastical corporations. Um, they don't they won't cease to exist uh, simply because the RCA may adopt these amendments. Um, they would simply no longer be kind of part of the RCA polity, but that doesn't mean that they wouldn't have a role to play, kind of as Amanda was talking about. There may be programs in these regional synods, and they may it, it may rename itself. It may still continue to exist as a an ecclesiastical or nonprofit corporation and provide services to middle assemblies and, and perhaps not even I mean ones that aren't even um, in its region or that what it was doing before. It can also um, kind of from a legal standpoint, it can um, it can transfer assets. It can merge with um, another ecclesiastical corporation like that becomes the middle assembly. So there's I guess ultimately whatever um, a, a regional synod and the classes and a middle assembly can come up with, you can pretty much legally do. Um, so there's going to have to be that kind of discussion as you go forward. What do we want to do? Do we want this entity to exist after this restructuring in some capacity and providing some services and to whom, but that can all be done. Okay, um, Carlos, I, I know that all stated clerks have more questions. That does not mean all stated clerks have are allowed time for more questions in this forum. So I'm gonna turn, a, I'm gonna open this up to everybody now. Um, again, if you are out in Zoom, if you are watching this and out in Zoom world, you can ask questions, but you need to raise your electronic hand. Um, some of you have put questions in the Q&A, and I've asked you if you wanted to raise your electronic hand and you haven't answered me yet, so let me, fi let me find out about that. Some of you are putting questions in the webinar chat. Please don't. I, I mean, I know they're wonderful questions, but um, at the moment, there is one person monitoring the Q&A and the raised hands and the webinar chat, and um, it gets a little hairy around here. Um, Anybody who wants to make a big enough donation to expand the staffing of the Reformed Church Center may call Kathy Proctor and take care of that, but probably not for this program. We start off with Susan Dorward. Susan, would you go ahead and unmute yourself and chime in? Uh, in what respect? Your, it's your question. I don't know. Uh, okay, so... I have a couple of questions. I've been going through the chat and the Q and A. Um, with the chat, I've been asking, how often would the middle assemblies be meeting? And if we are such a broad band of churches that are trying to come together, how do we meet and how often? That was number one. And number two was a classes now affirms and guides and mentors commission pastors. What if the church of a commission pastor um, chooses to jo uh, join a certain middle assembly that does not affirm a commission pastor? I'd be happy to respond. Uh, Amanda, Brian, jump in anytime you want, but this is stuff I deal with all the time. Um, the first question is how often will a middle assembly meet? Uh, the Book of Church Order continues to maintain the minimum that you have to have at least one classes meeting a year. Uh, but most classes meet at least twice. Some meet three times. And many have special meetings uh, for the examination of seminary students or commissioned pastors. So the answer to your question is the middle assembly will meet as often as it decides it needs to meet to carry out the functions and goals that it has. And that mm -hmm. may include additional meetings that are just designed to build relationships. I think that's one of the things that the restructuring team expressed a lot of concern about is that if we're going to have middle assemblies that function well, we have to have other ways to build connections. Mm -hmm. And perhaps this starts with pastors, uh, perhaps meeting on a regular basis in small groups, but it can include other kinds of meetings that would be held 
um, educational seminars uh, that would be provided uh, so that people can gather uh, either in person or electronically. And again, the geography will influence whether or not you try to have in-person meetings, uh, but having at least one in-person meeting a year uh, would be helpful. Well, second question, what do we do about uh, commission pastors? Uh, commission pastors are unique in the sense that their ordination uh, and commissioning does not transfer from one classes to another. And a classes that has a commission pastor apply to serve within it uh, has the responsibility of determining whether that commission pastor has received adequate training uh, and may need additional training for what they are being asked to do. Um, and again, it's we don't mandate mandate the use of commission pastors. Uh, some classes have found them to be far more helpful and have implemented programs of training. Um, if you are in a classes that has never had a commission pastor, you may want to reach out to classes who have and maybe even take advantage of the training programs that are available uh, through that classes or through Western Seminary or New Brunswick Seminary. Uh, or other organizations that have been established to train and equip commission pastors. And there are a list of them. Um, so I can't tell you if a class is still has the responsibility and right to say a church can be well served by a commission pastor or not. And the changes in the Book of Church Order do not change in any way uh, that responsibility. It just transfers to the middle assembly if the name is changed. But again, the Middle Assembly only changes its name if you vote in favor of the 10th Amendment that's listed, which changes the name of classes universally to that of Middle Assembly. In the, um, let me just talk quickly about the structure of the amendments, because that may help. Um, the Book of Church Order goes through and has all kinds of provisions for consistory, then the classes, then the regional synod, and then the general synod. The, the regional synod portion is like the smallest part of, was the smallest part of the Book of Church Order, and the classes section is one of the larger sections of the Book of Church Order because it has all kinds of stuff in there. And, and rather than, um, you know, delete the classes section and the regional synod section and come up with a new section about middle assembly, we simply deleted the smaller regional synod section and transferred those um, few responsibilities other places the classes the classes section and, and every all the requirements in there and all the rules and responsibilities that's still there and that's not going to change it it will be called the classes the middle assembly will be called the classes unless you vote to change the name to middle assembly if you vote to change the name of middle assembly we're just going to go through the book of church order and replace classes with middle assembly but everything that a classes is doing now in middle assembly will be required to do um, if this passes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Russell Camp, would you go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question? Good day, folks. Yeah, I'm wondering if there's anything you wish you had done better in putting this together, things that are saying, oh, gee, if we thought of this a year or two ago, we would have done this. Hi, Russell. Been been six talking, months. Howard. Yeah, we've been talking about this for two years. And originally, when the first proposal of the restructuring team came out, if you remember, there was a whole new nomenclature and there was a lot, a lot of things changing uh, that were suggested. And we actually started talking about throwing the entire Book of Church order out and starting over again. Uh, fortunately for us, um, the proposal, the restructuring team was changed uh, that simply said, you know, we're going to keep our present structure and we're going to use some of the same names uh, and we're, we're not going to try to, you know, reinvent the wheel. Uh, and that made it a lot easier for us. We spent uh, all, close to a year going through the Book of Church Order over and over and over again and looking at what previously had been done, particularly in uh, 2007 uh, with the report that was given at that time, which actually suggested the creation of judicial bodies. 
So we kind of built on the experience of many in the past. Uh, we did it, our work to try to make sure that we had all of the bases covered. Uh, and we felt that we accomplished our mandate. Um, again, as was mentioned before by Brian, uh, we our mandate was rather limited to implementing the recommendations of the restructuring team. Uh, so that's the way we did our work. Uh, we did not uh, seek to be innovative. We simply um, tried to implement what what we had been given. So and you can judge you're... whether it was adequate. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, and... And, and I will do that. But um, I also wanted to say, here's your chance. If you say, if you're thinking, yeah, here was our charge. We did it. Gee, we could have done it better in this way. Is there anything like that hanging out there? It seems like there would be because yeah, it's a I, pretty big project. But yeah, I, I would didn't say know about it. I would say we did a, we did a lot of work ahead of time um, in order to try to not have that be the situation. Having multiple readers from multiple perspectives reading through it, seeing you know what kind of things came up for them, addressing those things as they came up. So not that we, I, I'm not in any way saying that we did it perfectly or that it's a perfect, or that it's a perfect product, but I also think we're pretty early in on the process too. And so some of it won't be realized until it's realized kind of thing. Um, and, and there's only so much you can do ahead of time to, but, but I would say we're almost too early in the process to say right. there's things that we regret um, at, at this point we are where we are kind of thing. And they're, yeah. So I think Brian, they'll maybe want to speak to that for a minute too. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the book of church orders, 170 plus pages um, and you do your level best. And we did go through it like line by line several times. And you always try and say, okay, well, what about this? Or what about that? Or what about this? Or what about that? And, and invariably we probably missed something in that process. Um, but you don't you don't see it at the time. You do your best to go through and try and button up every possible um, contingency, and and certainly we we may have missed something, and and I will regret that when that comes up. But at the time, it's like I I, I think we I think we got it. I think we got it. But I'm, I mean, my experience as an attorney has shown me no, you you miss something along the way. Now I will say we did try and build in some flexibility for things, like we did try and say, look at. Like for instance, middle assemblies can transfer churches through mutual consent and so give give the parties the opportunity to do that rather than having it like some kind of regulation built into the or some kind of requirement built into the book of church order to provide some more flexibility for those kind of things. I do have a request though, uh, and that is if you do find something uh, that we missed that you let us know. Uh, and also one more request, uh, and this I learned very early on in my experience within a classes, the way to handle imperfect uh, recommendations uh, is usually to vote in favor of the recommendation if you agree with it in principle. And then if you see something in it that's problematic that needs to change, then ask the Commission on Church Order to uh, propose additional amendments that would fix the problem. If you keep voting down amendments to the Book of Church Order, because they aren't perfect, nothing will ever change. I appreciate the wisdom in that answer, and I am quite satisfied that um, you currently don't see anything, but you're realistic enough to know that something will almost inevitably, inevitably crop up in the future. And I'm okay with that. I just want to make sure there's nothing that... It depends on how big the issue is, whether mm -hmm. you vote it down or up. It's not just vote it and then we'll fix it later. Because if it was something really big, then you wouldn't want to do that. From what from your answers, I believe there is nothing really big of that size at this point. So thank you. Um, thank you, Russell. Um, as we move on, because we have lots of we have a hundred and 50 some people in this in this um, webinar and we have lots of other people with waiting to ask questions. I would remind everybody that of course they've missed something. This is why every time the general synod meets there are amendments to be done. 
And this is why every time the General Synod meets, the Commission on Church Order has a report. I've I've never been to a general. I've been to thirty some General Synods. I've never been to one where the where the Commission on Church Order came in and said, "Nah, nothing's going on." We all we all took our we all took our meeting time and had a really nice weekend, and that was it. Nope, never happens. The other thing I remind everybody is that. The restructure was not done by the Commission on Church Order. The restructure was done by the Restructure Task Force. They are not here because we dismissed them. They are done. They are disbanded. So they can, they don't have to wish they were doing anything anymore. With all that in mind, I'm going to call on Terry Troya and ask her to unmute and ask her questions. Hi. Thank you. This has been really wonderful. And I, I hope we can get this on recording somewhere. Um, it's important for our congregation, the Reformed Church of Huguenot Park, Staten Island, to be part of a middle assembly that is open and affirming for the acceptance of people who identify as LGBTQ plus in marriage and ordination, which is not our current classes of New York. So how do we as a congregation move to a middle assembly that is open and affirming we're thinking of Rockland, Westchester. That's the closest one that I know about. And then my second question, and how do we make that possible? And then the question of our consistory was also, to what body will belong our property, the church property, which I think used to be the classes? Does it then become the possession of the middle assembly? And if we move to another middle assembly, say Rockland, Westchester, does the property in Staten Island become the property of Rockland, Westchester? or whatever they'll call themselves. You want to start, Amanda? Uh, Howard, Howard's just itching to, ask, to answer that question about church property, I know. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, well, I, I'll do my best, Howard, and then you can correct me, but property is not actually owned by the classes. Uh, it's, it's owned by the, it's still owned by the church. It's that the way that our, um, the book of church order is written and the way our structure is, is that in order to do anything with your property, it requires the approval of classes. So it's a differentiation of like who actually owns it. The, the church actually owns it, but but within our structure, uh, you can't take a loan on it without speaking to the class, without having classes approval, those types of things. So there is a differentiate, like it, it doesn't, the ownership doesn't change in that sense. The ownership would still remain with the church now the middle assembly would now be the one who would be doing those approvals of something that's going to be changing with uh the status of of the property um so I, i'll at least i how did i do howard uh, you did great in principle that's exactly what the book of church order says there's only one exception and that is if the classes uh started your church and never deeded the property to your consistory uh to serve as trustees it may still be <laughs> in the name of the classes, but that's rare. So uh, if you're concerned about property ownership, the first thing you should do is go to your county clerk and find out, you know, ask for a copy of the deed and find out what name is on it. Uh, for some of you, it might be difficult because you've been around for a few hundred years, uh, but there you should be, you should know who owns the property and what name the deed is in. And that determines, I mean, in any court of law, uh, the name on the deed is the people who own the property. Uh, to respond to your other part of the question is how do you switch classes? Um, the Book of Church Order has just a few little guidelines, and that is it's the responsibility of the regional synod to move a, a church uh, that requests a transfer from one classes to another within its bounds. If it's to another regional synod, it's the decision of the general synod. Uh, and it's simply by making that petition either to the regional synod or general synod uh, and uh, writing a letter or saying we want to transfer. Uh, there are additional guidelines published in the 2021 minutes of General Synod under the report of the Commission on Church Order. Uh, there were guidelines which we called rules and regulations that were adopted by the General Synod, so you'll find them in the minutes uh, for the transfer to another denomination. But also at the very end of that, there were rules and regulations that were written for transferring churches from one classes to another in the RCA. And in brief, 
it basically says that if you've got a supermajority of the congregation and a supermajority of the consistory that are uh, requesting the transfer, then uh, the regional synod should, except they're under extenuating circumstances, um, approve that request. Thanks. Just to follow up, if I could, um, if we ended up wanting to uh, align ourselves with the UCC and leave the RCA, uh, does the property go with us or is that, again, under consideration of the classes or regional synod? Um, in that case, you make the application to the classes and the classes uh, looks assigns the committee to go through the process that's listed in the Book of Church Order. And again, I refer to the additional regulations uh, relating to that section that were adopted by the 2021 uh, General Synod uh, that again, if a supermajority of the congregation and consistory vote in favor of it, uh, the classes um, should vote in favor unless there are extenuating circumstances. This, uh, to, and further to that, to that question, I mean, we're kind of at step one of this process, which is answering the question, do we even want to do this? And if we answer that question, yes, we want to do this, yes, we want to restructure, then the next question, a logical question would be, okay, well, exactly how are we going to do this? And what's the timeline going to be for us to do this? And that's kind of what Amanda was talking about in her in her presentation. Um, if, if it comes back from the classes that, yes, we want to do this, yes, we want to restructure, and so we are going to have to create these middle assemblies, I, I and I... I have no business saying this other than my own personal belief, but I, I think we're going to end up kind of drafting or having some additional guidance and timelines to put some more structure around exactly what the, the, the restructuring is going to do at that point in time. Because you're you're going to have to we're going to have to form these middle assemblies, and there's going to be a, have to be a process to that. We have we have a, a, you know, we we're talking about getting rid of one of our middle assemblies that is involved in that process. <laughs> Um, currently, as currently constituted, so we're gonna. There's gonna have to be, do some uh, some additional work here to probably figure that out. But you don't have to wait. Uh, and within our region, there's already uh, quite a number of churches that have requested transfer to other classes, and we're considering a disbanding one of the classes that we have. We're considering combining two of the other classes. Uh, so we certainly want to encourage uh, all of you no matter where you are, to consider uh, what will best benefit you as a congregation, as a church, and as a class, and as within a region, the proposed middle assemblies. So uh, please uh, don't wait until next May to begin this process. Um, continue the conversation now and think about where you want to land. Okay. And I think somewhere in there, there was a question about, um, is the recording of this going to be available? The recording of Reformed Church Center programs is always available going all the way back to 2017. Um, you will get a lovely note from Zoom, courtesy of Zoom tomorrow, from me, courtesy of Zoom, because you were here. And um, it will tell you all about that and how to get the recording for free for nothing. Okay, Bill to Winkle. Go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Bill, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent webinar and thanks to the participants. Um, this is maybe something that's too early to answer, but it's a timeline uh, and process question. So right now the Reformation of classes that was just mentioned by Howard, it's happening all around, I think is happening under the current BCO. So regional synods have to reorganize after consultation with classes. And if a classist doesn't like the reorganization, I believe they have a right to appeal to the general synod. The the regional synod's reorganization of a classis, I believe, can be appealed to the general synod under the current BCO. So my question is, we're in this transition 
where we're going to take out, I believe, those regional synod BCO provisions that cover the right of a classes to object to the reorganization of the classes into another classes or disbanding it. So I'm not expecting anyone to be able to answer this right now, but I just think there's the potential for a classes to not like what the, a regional synod has done to them to petition to the regional synod at the same regional synod where the BCO provisions are removed. And then after that, there will be more restructuring happening. Um, but as I understand it, the general synod will do the restructuring after the middle, after the regional synods have been removed as an assembly. Is that correct? Um, partially. Uh, okay. There still will be an opportunity to file a complaint uh, because of the, well, the intent of the restructuring team was that the restructuring would take place while the existing regional synods continue to exist. Uh, so, okay. so the timeline, exactly how this will work out, we don't know what the general synod will do, but it's certainly possible that the general synod will, uh, if all the classes vote in favor or enough vote in favor of the proposed amendments, the general synod uh, next summer will have to make a decision about uh, implementation timeline. Uh, for example, will they say, um, yes, now the regional synod will have uh, uh, one more year to uh, uh, restructure uh, because they'll need the extra time uh, and therefore will vote in favor of, uh, of our confirming vote of um, the proposed amendments that were approved by the classes for a year. I don't know if they're going to do that, uh, but it's certainly possible that there will be additional time. I just say, well, don't count on it. Uh, the classes should do what they need to do now, and the regional synod should do what they need to do now to think about what's the best way uh, to restructure ourselves and so that classes can function without the regional synod around. And I would just add to that, like this was one of the most difficult things with like the timing and how all of this happens, because you don't want to restructure, like have everybody working on all of this restructure for two to three years, and then it goes to classes and then it gets denied. So it was kind of like, this was a way of getting the ball rolling so that we can see, is this the direction we're headed? Is this, is this what we're discerning that God is calling us towards? now so that we're not doing all of this work and then taking the vote the, the feeling was it's better to get this and knowing that once you take the vote it still takes two years for it to fully happen and so the decision was made to do the vote now so we would know the direction that we're happening so that people know then if we're restructuring or not um and so it's it's not going to be perfect <laughs> and there was no perfect solution to that to that problem but the thought was this allows us to know that we're, you know, we're in one mind going in the same direction. And then as Howard said, there's the possibility then of, of Synod um, making some recommendations or things to maybe delay the full implementation of the plan um, or coming up with a, with a timeline for how that implementation will actually work of the, the changes. Yeah. And the hope of the restructuring team was that, that the regional synods would not um, lord it over uh, the current classes and churches and provide, you know, come up with a plan and impose it on the churches and classes within their region, that this would be truly a consultation, a conversation that reaches a consensus uh, and a plan that everyone can accept. Because the last thing we want is all kinds of complaints coming to the Commission on Church uh, Judicial Business of the General Synod, trying to mediate of the plan that's been adopted by the regional synod. And James, why don't you do a crowdfunding among the classes for a follow-up seminar? Because the interest level is obviously very high. I'm sure the classes of Wisconsin would be happy to contribute to such an effort. We have a constant crowdfunding here at the Reformed Church Center. <laughs> Go to mbts.edu slash donate and leave your donation and we will All right. and we will do this. Part of part of having more more programs, and we may have one 
now in the coming year, depending uh, depending on all sorts of things, like how the classes vote. But um, part of it, too, is dependent on, it turns out there are only 12 months in the year. Yeah. And it turns out no matter how many ways I re I try to reconfigure the work of New Brunswick Seminary, there are still only 12 months in the year. And so, you know, we run out of times to, that we can we can do programs, but we do the best we can, Bill. Um, Thank you also, very much. Speaking, speaking as a person who moderates the committee in my own classes where we where we review and make recommendations on amendments. I thank the Commission on Church Order profusely for not sending us amendments to go with all 11 recommendations from the restructured task force in the same year. We were we were thinking, you know, we were going to have sleeping bags at the classes meeting in January and just camp out for a few days, but we don't. Paul Jansen. Go ahead and unmute and Paul? Just put in the chat his mic isn't working. Oh. Paul, I'm gonna mute, I'm gonna um mute you again and let you try to sort that out and we'll come back to you. Tom Hendricks, would you go ahead and unmute and ask your question? I think I'm unmuted. Yes, you are. Uh, greetings to everyone, and thank you so much, all six of you, for the hard work of putting this thing together at the Reformed Church Center. Thank you for the coordination. This does clarify. Um, it may not matter for me, because I'm a uh, retired RCA. That makes me a has-been. Uh, however, uh, I stay interested and vitally concerned about how my beloved denomination is doing. Um, just um it, it appeared in print so i, I james uh sh should i reread my question what's the best way to save time yeah uh, everybody hasn't seen your question so okay. ask your question okay i didn't know that fine um it, it, some of this has already come up but it seems to me that the uh, affinity model which we all seem to be locked into whether we should be or not going forward uh, whether or not there was there was restructure, and now the restructure is before us, um, that model may make it harder for for reason for shorthand for MAs should this whole thing pass uh, to define themselves uh, with the MAs doing most or all of the defining, as I think previously was mentioned in this webinar, uh, it may become um, too difficult. Uh, for the uh, various MAs or all of them to figure out uh, which congregations um, are are part of them and which ones are not um, than it was under the old geographical model. Uh, will this, and, and of course affinity helps helps with our theological diversity, which is kind of a way, it seems to me, of telling ourselves we don't have any differences when we really do. And so I'm just, my, my my basic question, sorry to take so long, is will this, do you guys suppose directly, uh, will, will this diversity, which our affinity model, uh, you know, allows us to have, uh, continue to crumble our RCA identity overall? as what we consider to believe to be a denomination. Um, as the middle assemblies define themselves, should this pass, um, are they not going to have more difficulty uh, with the affinity concept being a continuing presence in the RCA? Uh, I want to first say that the word affinity does not appear in any of the proposed amendments from the Commission on Church Order. Uh, and really, none of the proposed amendments, now you can correct me if you find something there, establishes kind of a new understanding of how things happen. The only thing that's there that's new is that churches will be able to petition, as they can now, uh, to change or to transfer to another middle assembly. 
and it will be if both the sending and receiving middle assemblies agree, uh, they will honor that petition. Um, so there's a process as there is now for transferring, uh, but it'll be by mutual agreement. Uh, and those are long conversations about how we can live and, and work with each other. And uh, boy, we, there's just not a one size fits all solution to that conversation. And certainly that's true. Thank you for that reaction. Yeah, and I would just echo kind of what, what I said before. I don't think everybody is looking for what we've defined as an affinity classes. Um, you know, some people say we've always had affinity classes, like our affinity was just our geography, um, where as, as now we're looking at different kinds of affinities. But all of that to say, I think pe some people are going to look for different for different things in that. And so I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that every middle assembly is going to look like an affinity classes and an affinity like city classes. Some people call city classes an affinity classes. Like there, there's all different kinds kinds of things that we can say is affinity. Like I said, geography can be an affinity. Um, so I think it's important when we're using that language too that like we haven't already defined in our minds what affinity means um, because affinity can can be many different things. And I think as it was said earlier too, like it, this will in some ways force us to find other ways that we can organically, I think Carlos talked about this, organically connect with one another, perhaps even outside of our middle assemblies. And maybe this will help us to, to, to be able to do that by this reorganization. If the, if the restructuring team were here, and I'm quite certain they're glad they're not, um, but if they were here, I think they would probably say, this is an opportunity, ultimately. This is an opportunity for us to work together and to discern how best to organize ourselves, because there aren't necessarily a whole lot of rules around it. I mean, there, there, as Howard said, the word affinity doesn't appear. I mean, in this process, if you go into it thinking this is an opportunity, then we could have all kinds of different, um, you know, middle assemblies that come out the backside of this. And the hope is that we are, um, you know, that, that, the churches find the place and middle assemblies, you know, organize themselves in a way that is, um, it is organic and it is helpful for ministries going forward. And that you saw that kind of evolve over the restructuring team process where they started out, they originally were calling it these resource centers, right? Um, which nobody liked, but um, they, they were calling it these resource centers but the idea was, okay, we're just going to have these groups that are going to support all the ministries of these churches. And I think that concept is still there in, in this, in the middle assembly. So there's really, this is an opportunity more than kind of a, you know, uh, something to be afraid of. Like, let's go into this and see what we can really make from this. At one point they were even called clusters. And go, the people on the restructure there. task force should have known the amount of snark present in people who are church order geeks that they never should have used that word. But oh well. Um, before we go on to the next person with a raised hand, Brian Brian Engel has posted this in the Q and A. Um, by the way, Paul has said his question got answered, so thank you. Um, what if a church wants to transfer to another classes, but that receiving classes doesn't want to receive or refuses a church? Are we talking about the future? Um, I guess we are. Uh, you're talking about uh, after the regional synods go away or before? Um, there, before the regional synod goes away, the regional synod gets to make that decision. Um, and certainly would have to do have a conversation with the receiving classes of why don't you want this church that wants to join you i i really think there aren't very many i don't know that that's ever happened so we're talking about something that's hypothetical and i mean most classes if they had the opportunity to have one more church and more assessments uh income they would say yay you know welcome and assuming that the church had good reasons to join the classes um that would be fine. But, uh, you know, before regional synod goes away, the regional synod gets to make the decision. Um, after regional synod goes away, uh, we're still hoping for a more cooperative model, uh, but the general synod ultimately will have the responsibility for forming classes. Um, so the general synod could entertain 
some kind of petition, uh, but I don't know why a church would want to join a classist that didn't want it. So I think it's pretty hypothetical and unrealistic. Okay. Thank you. Ha Thank you, Howard. John I just want to highlight, can I just highlight oh. real quick, James, the, sure. in the in the chat that Michelle and Greg are here from the restructured team and there might be others. So uh, just to say thank you for all of your work and knowing those two people, I'm sure if people have specific questions about re the restructuring team and how that process went and even what their thinking was that um, I I'm going to speak for them, but I think they would be open to those conversations because they do want to be helpful in that in that process. So um, just wanted to point that out. Okay, and also I was about to call on John Chen and I'm still going to. It is Hi. now 1.32. We, okay. we contracted to end this at 1.30. However, because there are people in the queue, there are now six of you with raised hands in the queue. Um, so we're going to go ahead and answer those questions. If you need to go ahead and leave, we understand. Go in, go in grace and enjoy the rest of your day. I hope you can be with us in November when we have a talk about RCA or reformed in general ecumenism with two former members of the WCRC, um, one from the executive committee and one from the staff. Um, and I know who you all are who've raised your hands already. So if anybody tries to sneak in, no, I'll I'll know that too. Just can in case speak? you ever can wondered. John, you're up. Okay, thank you. Um, it just dawned on me that the uh, mill assembly is kind of clunky because it does not fall in line with our system of naming like the general senate and plus we are not presbyterian so so i think if it's more more in line with using if we want to name we uh, miller miller assembly we should call it uh miller senate this way uh general senate would not feel all alone by itself so uh it's more like uh i think naming is important in our tradition so i don't know that has been considered before, but I like to, if it does, I like to bring it up again for reconsideration. Thank you. I'll handle that pretty quickly. Uh, one is the good news is you, you can vote on that separately. Uh, that's the 10th amendment in the proposed amendments. If you don't like the change from classes to middle assembly, vote against that. Uh, if you'd rather have something else, uh, Overture General Synod, uh, to change the name to something else. But I will speak for the restructuring team. They got a ton of feedback on this. <laughs> and they entertained almost any conceivable possibility for renaming this group, which will function in the place of the classes plus the regional center responsibilities. Uh, and they came up with middle assembly. Not everybody was happy with that, but it was the best um, it was the best suggestion that they had according to the restructuring team conversations. Thank you. Um, and by the way, there, there may yet be an overture coming from someone, I can't imagine who, pointing out that historically, we didn't have a general synod before we had particular synods. It was just a synod and making, and therefore making the overture that it go back to just being a synod. Um, okay, Jill Fenske. Go ahead. Uh, Jill Fenske, I am from the Passaic Valley Classes in New Jersey and Regional Synod of Mid-Atlantic. Um, both our classes and our Regional Synod have subsidiary corporations attached to them. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's been any thinking about what happens with those entities? Um, we haven't certainly dictated what has to happen with those entities. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in the amendment that requires anything to happen to those entities. Mm -hmm. So it will kind of be up to those entities and the constituents that they serve to decide what to do with them. There may be property and finances in a in a yes. presently constituted regional synod that it's going to have to decide what to do. Um, and, and like I said, it may, from a legal standpoint, it may be that it it continues to exist as a kind of 
third party ecclesiastical um, corporation that will provide services um, to, to churches and others. It may be that it, it merges in with um, or changes its name and, and becomes the, um, you know, or merges with the, the classes. Um, I, as, a, as a lawyer, I can tell you pretty much whatever you decide you want to do, you can almost always do in that regard. That's just a matter of corporation law. Okay. Um, so it's just a matter of deciding what it is that you want to do. Okay. And when you say deciding as a corporation, you mean that either the classes or the regional synod would make those decisions? I, I, I would anticipate that the regional synod and the classes together would be talking about what do we want to do with this as part of this restructuring process, and they would jointly okay. agree on a way forward or some some outcome. Okay. Okay. I'm concerned. That's all. Um, Jill, I can give you a little more closer to home, mid-Atlantic specific um, response. There is now a there is now a committee meeting for of which every classes in Mid Atlantic has two delegates, including yours, and we are discussing things to bring back to the classes and to the whole synod, okay. exactly what we recommend doing with all of this fun stuff. Okay. Um, it would be helpful for the synod to, to let us know that, but what yeah, I will await I will await information. Um, we well. We asked your your clerks were responsible for letting you know that. So I can't be everywhere. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, Jay Vogelar's question. He does not have a working mic at the moment. Um, I get the sense that there is little difference between a classis and a, and the middle assembly. So what is the purpose of changing the terms if they continue to do the same thing they did before? Well, um, the restructuring team felt that it was important to have a name change because there are additional responsibilities that the classes will have because they've been delegated from the regional synod. And they wanted to suggest this is something new. This is not a continuation of our present structure. And we want to see the classes function in a way that's more robust and provides more services and fulfills um, all of its responsibilities in in perhaps better than it has in the past. John Norton, go ahead and unmute and jump in. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I was involved in the Regional Senate uh, of New York uh, 10 years ago, so it's been quite a while, uh, but I keep uh, wondering uh, what's what's the real relationship now between the medical middle uh, assembly and the general senate. Um, when I was uh, involved in all of this, I remember I had about seventeen percent of my time was spent going to denominational functions uh, in which, in some ways, I was asked, uh, Norton, we want you to go back to your uh, regional center and the classes there and try to sell them on this particular principle that they were espousing. And I remember in... Uh, uh, many arguments with people at that upper level of, above me uh, when I would say, uh, you people didn't create me. You didn't create recent, regional senates. The classes did, and they, they, they created regional senates for the purpose of helping them uh, do ministry because they couldn't uh, individual pastors running churches really didn't have the time or sometimes the expertise to do the very things that were needed by the local church. And, of course, there was always uh, certain individuals who, who in a class will say, well, I can do that. Uh, but it was classes, uh, 
Classy's really had a difficult time doing the, the answering the questions that were really being asked. And when I think about what I did for my 19 years in the regional Senate, was that I spent a lot of time sitting in pastor's office talking about doing ministry. And quite often, pastors would ask me, well, would you come back and speak with my consistory? And I did that. And in the 19 years that I was there, I, I kept trying to figure out how much time am I spending where. And I think with 160-some churches that I was involved with, I probably dealt with uh, problems of doing ministry. You've all been talking about uh, legal things and how do we settle a, an argument between somebody? Well, that's all very important and very necessary, but that was a, a minor part of what I actually did. I didn't have to spend my time worrying about you know the 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 legal expertise that was needed to solve the problem i just knew that when we got into it there was a there was a p plan for how to deal with that and we would struggle through it but most of the time pastors just like somebody from the upper denomination who would come and sit and talk about ministry with them and have them say well, here's what's going on uh, in the same kind of menu uh, over here at this church or at this class or, at, or in the denomination. Uh, the only reason why people in, and I'm giving you my opinion now, why, why churches wanted me to go to a general senate meeting was to come back and tell them, well, what happened? And what's your opinion about what happened? Uh, I hired people in the regional Senate to go and do the very same thing that I was doing, which was sit in pastor's offices and talk with them about ministry. Mm -hmm. And that was the real reason why when we ask questions about money. Yes, I knew there was a, a grievance about, uh, well, we got to pay uh, regional senates money to exist. And uh, I remember one time we had a, uh, a problem in which, oh, it was the, the great uh, financial problem of 2008. It came along, and uh, the regional senate said, "Well, we want to give every church in our regional senate the opportunity not to pay anything that was in our budget. They could, they could overture in, and well, we had one particular uh, uh, ministry." that a couple of people didn't like, and they didn't like it because the representative for uh, their uh, reason to be didn't show up at the regional senate meeting. And so they voted down a $5,000 expense for this uh, ministry. Well, at the next regional senate meeting, the, those people showed up up and said what they wanted, and they reinstated him. And that was the entire budget was was open to all of the churches. You can cancel anything you want, even Norton's position. Nobody did a thing except that one five thousand uh, dollar thing. So we didn't pay that for that year, but we were asked to reinstate it. I guess, I don't know, maybe people felt guilty or something. But anyway, that's, uh, I'm just uh, talking about my experience in the past seems to be, after listening to all of the things that have been said, is that the thing that really concerned me are not what's happening in this meeting, 
but they will be happening when the classes decide what are we going to do with regional centers? Yeah, absolutely, John. John yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Howard. Do you want to? Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to say, John, you've just given a good example of why the restructuring team uh, suggested that the middle assemblies become large enough to have staff to go and sit in pastor's offices and talk about ministry. Yeah, that, that's basically what I was going to say is that this, um, and I'm glad that the next person in line is Hanoi, because I think he'll also speak to what the General Synod was thinking about doing in, in some of those ways as well in helping to equip our churches. Um, but yeah, the idea be behind a lot of this restructuring was the idea that rather than having 130 churches that you're trying to help with ministry as a regional synod, that it would be on more of a, a classes level. So our classes might be a little bit larger, but that they would be able to support somebody being able to help with the mission and ministry of their, of their local churches. Okay. Um, Hanoi Avila, I'm going to unmute you and um, give you a chance to talk. Um, for those who haven't had a chance to meet him yet, Hanoi is the new chief ministry officer for the Reformed Church in America on the GSC staff and is in charge of what we here in New Brunswick and certainly in my office at New Brunswick refer to as the other center, <laughs> with all due respect. All right, James. Well, thank you so much for uh, putting this together as well as the team. I know this has been a team effort and thank you for uh, allowing me to ask the team a question as we are also wrestling with restructuring um, at the Center for Ministry and Church Multiplication. So what we have decided that one of our main focus is to come alongside classes leaders um, to support them in this process, right? And um, so we want to do that by one resourcing um, as well as by providing um, what we've already launched, which is a help center where people can can write to equip at rca.org. And so our goal is to um, connect people, right, uh, so that they can go to the person that might be able to provide the answer or the resource. So my question to you is, how do you see um, the work of the center um, through resourcing that we can come alongside and do effective work in, in this process, right? I think that's a question for you, James. <laughs> no, he's talking about how do you see the work of the other center, the Center yeah. for Ministry? And, and that, might be a, that might be a question really for the state of clerks yeah. to talk about as we go through this process yeah there are lots yeah, of I, I think oh go ahead yeah <laughs> i was just gonna say well i think i think as we as we move forward it's going to become more clear uh, i think again we're kind of in this timing issue of like you, like the first kind of decision is are we restructuring and then once we determined yes we are restructuring i think that will be a, a Part of that will be that dreaming of then, like, how do we help each other, and what does this new structure actually live out look like? Um, and it's hard; it's hard to know that at this point in the process. I think we've done some initial dreaming, which is what the restructuring team has done. But now it kind of comes to the point of like, okay, so we need to decide if this is the direction that we're going, and once that direction is set, then I think that will will be a great opportunity then for uh, the center to be able to ask some of those questions on in this new structure. Also, how how do you guys want to be resourced in a general synod level or helping even facilitate those conversations that we talked about earlier about the different um, assets that different, uh, not assets as in money in place, but like in, in the kinds of ministry that different regional synods have been able to provide, like how do we bring those together and make those more available to more churches? I think that's that's where I see the center's work really being able to, to be handy and in things, which I know this isn't necessarily the synod, but general synod in, ge in general, like things like the website that just came up about middle assemblies, like it's really helpful that there is a place that we can all go that has all those resources in one place. Like I think right now that's where I see more of those needs being met is in those just kind of really logistical 
things. But then as we move forward, I think it will be with the center also helping with some of that, like listening opportunities and figuring out then how does ministry look post vote next year um, and that type of thing. Excellent. Thank you. And Hanoi, you might want to check the chat. Something was dropped there that you might want to look at. And I uh, also the stated clerks uh, from the whole denomination meet annually just before the General Synod. Uh, talk to Annalisa Lammers and get on our agenda. Mm -hmm. Yes. Brian Engel. You're up. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up um, within our classes. Uh, each of us ministers supervise at least two congregations. And I would say for other classes in upstate New York, um, at least a couple of the classes, the ministers are supervising two, three, maybe four congregations. And there are many churches that are maybe five to 15 people uh, on a Sunday morning. And we just haven't had the heart to do the consolidation. So I guess where I was leading in terms of my earlier question about refusing a, a congregation, when I think about, hey, there's a, there's a congregation that, that meets with six people on a Sunday and they want to join your, the middle assembly, um, I could see a, a middle assembly saying, we'd like to, but, but we, we can't. It's one more church to, to supervise or to hate to say lead in hospice. I don't mean to be harsh. We've just never had the heart to do that hard thing here in upstate New York. And, and that's where kind of where I was coming with that question about refusing. Thank you, Brian. That gives some context for that. Um, within our region, we've been pretty straightforward about um, helping churches to understand that every church has a lifespan. And there are sometimes uh, when a church has to be in hospice care and make plans for the use of its assets uh, for the future. Uh, so that may include revitalization and taking a new uh, uh, direction for ministry, but it may include closing the church. And we have closed within our classes quite a number of churches that came to the end of their lifespan. Um, so that is a class's responsibility that will transfer to the middle assembly and the middle assembly will have to take seriously the viability of every local congregation and see what it can do in the area of revitalization and or helping the church to go through a process of hospice. Thank you. And just to follow up with that, I would really encourage you um, to reach out to Hanoi because you didn't really get to talk about it. That's one of the big things that the center is looking into is how to support and how to help churches who are going, who are, um, who don't have a minister in them. Um, and so I would, I would also look to that as a resource, obviously that actually falls within the classes bounds, but there may be some resources out there that could be helpful. And like I said, I know that's one of the things that the center is focusing on, um, are, are those those types of churches? Well, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you to all of the participants um, for a very lively discussion. Um, thank you to Rita and Carlos and Grace for getting the discussion started on behalf of all stated clerks everywhere. Um, thank you to Howard and Amanda and Brian for bringing us wonderful information from the Commission on Church Order. There has been an unusually um, busy chat going on. And so as we have done sometimes in the past, I'm going to ask Steve Mann to save the chat and we will try to create a document that will get attached to this program so that when you go looking for the recording of the program, you can also find the chat. And if you think, oh, there was something in the chat I'd really like to look at again, You'll have a shot at that. Um, until we all get together again, I wish you a pleasant fall. Have a good afternoon. And we'll see you soon. Thank you.